Welcome to Lynn Cullen Live at PGHCityPaper.com. Email your questions and comments to Lynn at PGHCityPaper.com. Hello, good morning. If it is morning to you, whatever and whenever you're listening to this, it's a beautiful morning here in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania on July 9th. And uh, we've got an hour we can spend together and talk and uh, maybe, I don't know, learn something, maybe. Maybe have a laugh or two. Maybe despair. (laughs) I so love the shows when we don't get into despair. I so love those shows. And who knows, this might be one. Uh, Here's... (laughs) I I took the bus in, and I was uh, looking, as all of us on the bus do, I was looking into my hand as I read things on my my smartphone, and I came upon this little piece that maybe you didn't see, and I thought I'd share it with you because it's just so (laughs) – it made me laugh – on second um, perusal, I am not laughing as much, but oh, Lord, here it is. Here it is. Our politics in a nutshell. There's a guy down in Texas. He's a Republican. He's running for Congress. His uh, name is Larry Smith. And uh, he has uh, said that he suspects that President Obama— uh, actually has a mental illness. Oh, my God, what? Uh, yes, a mental Well, he names the mental illness. It's one, it's one that we sometimes do read about in, um, in stories. It's often a, fa- it's a fascinating mental illness called um, Munchausen syndrome by proxy. Quite a name. Munchausen syndrome by proxy. This is an extremely (laughs) rare condition. You often, when we do see it, when it gets in the papers, it's because some mother with a very ill child is found to um, have the disease and and consequently, turns out, has been making her child ill. It becomes a way to get attention by causing illness in someone you love. Munchausen syndrome by proxy. (coughs) Now, um, the reason this guy has decided that that's what Obama has is because since Munchausen's has to do with people in charge, parents, caretakers, uh, abusing children uh, that are in their care. He has suggested that because Obama is not adequately dealing with these tens of thousands of young refugees coming over our southwestern border, that he is, in fact, clearly suffering from Munchausen syndrome. Now, why would you say something that absurd? Why would you say anything like that? Do you think he said it as a laugh line? I... Uh, here's something else he said, just looking further down this piece. Uh... I do not believe in Christianity because I read a 2,000-year-old book. I believe in Christianity because I have witnessed it firsthand. And because I have witnessed Islam, I believe in it for what it really is, the death of humanity. Uh... The only good news here, I'm happy to tell you, is this guy is running against uh, 
Democrat who is, in fact, despite the fact that it's Texas, uh, expected to win the seat. Ay, 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 ay. So, do you think Barack Obama, when he wakes up in the morning, is he, you think he's like somebody serving a jail term and he's starting to make marks on the wall? In the in the in the bedroom there in the White House, you know, just this many days till I can get the hell out of here. This many days can I get the hell out of here? I mean, I I can understand why somebody would aspire to the office and even thrive in the office and feel that they could in fact do good in the office and 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 then I'm thinking that after what is this now 6 years almost of the reality of of living as president um and and realizing that so often there's so little you can do because of the intransigence of your so-called uh, legislative partners and and the conservatism of the uh, Supreme Court, and then not to mention the uh, horrors unfolding on a regular basis all over the world. I mean, why would you want to wake up to that on your plate? I think some people do. I personally would not. I would be, talk about a mental illness, I would be in need of so many pharmaceuticals to keep the anxiety and rage at bay. I wouldn't I don't think I'd be uh, capable of function. So, uh, just to tell you, I, I read all the papers today. I even looked online. I saw nothing that I wanted to talk about. N nothing. So, if any of you have some off-the-wall things that uh, you would like to throw into the mix, feel free. You can do it, obviously, online at uh, Lynn at pghcitypaper.com or you can call and the phone number is right over my head there 412-316-3381 uh, in the summer sometimes this happens I mean it's not like there isn't a lot of stuff happening but it's it's unpleasant <laughs> it's it's unpleasant, and it's a beautiful day, and I wore my beautiful day shirt. So, I mean, I just don't want to. Call her. Yes, good morning. Good morning. I just want to say this, Rick Perry. Rick Perry. You know, he's all blaming Obama about the borders and all that bullshit. Yeah. Where's his state rights? Suck it up, big boy. Take care of your state. Oh, yeah. All of a sudden now, you know, he wants the federal government to be involved. That's what kills me about these Republicans. Certain things, they want the federal government involved in other things. Oh, no, states' rights, states' rights. Well, it's a bunch of bullshit, as is usual. Uh, as usual, indeed. I, I hear you. Thank you. Yep. Yeah, hypocrisy. Although, technically, I can't, the border is the Fed's job, is it not? The border's the Fed's job, I would think. Yeah, technically. I mean, the Border Patrol is made, that's a federal position. Although the, the state and the, uh, the counties that sit on the border, I'm sure much of their policing has to do with uh, that border. So clearly, if things are working well, you would have all of these entities working in concert, working together harmoniously. And that ain't happening. So, what else I got? Ooh, the one thing I saw in the paper the guy got excited about, because what did I know? Do you have friends who don't tell you things? I mean, do you have friends where you find out what's going on by reading the newspaper? I do. Not all of them, but I do. And this is one of those cases. Because it's a case about, oh, more movies coming to Pittsburgh, more movies going to be shooting here, Will Smith's coming. Vin Diesel <laughs> coming. I don't think I've ever been to one of his movies. And um, 
they're talking about when these things are shooting and uh, what we can expect, because there's already two movies, I believe, shooting now. Um, but here it turns out that Will Smith is coming to make a film about NFL concussions. And I thought, what? Is that a documentary? What do you mean, NFL concussions? Well, it turns out he's focusing on a man whose name was Dr. Bennett Omalu. And I... That's not a name that, um, you know, necessarily rings a bell, certainly not in my head, although I've heard the name before. This is a guy who was a pathologist, I believe, right here in Pittsburgh. I know right here in Pittsburgh. I'm not sure he would have been then uh, working under perhaps Cyril Wecht, or maybe if it was post wecked whoever uh, was after. And here, so here's a guy uh, in, the, in the office down there, and it was he, the first scientist, doctor, pathologist in the world to detect what is now known as chronic traumatic encephalopathy. And that is the damage done to the brains of football players. And I suppose others who engage in sport where their heads are getting in uh, to concussive situations. It says here that it was a story in 2009 written in GQ, a story broken by, and here we go, my friend, and she's been a guest on this show, Jean Marie Laskus, uh, and I remember, I mean, she will talk um, ad nauseum on this issue because she learned so much from her research of that. And she was so blown away by this Bennett Omalu. And so I believe Will Smith is going to be playing Dr. Omalu. I just wonder how that... Does that sound like a movie when you discover that football players' brains are damaged? How does, does that make a good movie? Yeah, it could. Done right. Well, directed by, it's got a really uh, a good producer, Ridley Scott. He's put out an awful lot of good stuff. And also uh, directed by a guy named Peter Landsman, and I don't know if that's, I don't know his name. I don't know who he is. But they should start uh, setting up in the next couple of weeks, and they'll be filming in the fall. Uh, the piece was called Game Brain. It's not known if that would be the name of uh, the movie. So there you have it. I guess what it was is that this um, Dr. Omal uh, Omalu uh, by virtue of his uh, station in the in the medical examiner's office here, uh, got his hands on Mike Webster's brain, the great and now deceased center for the Pittsburgh Steelers, Mike Webster, who. went on such a sad, tragic, downward trajectory after leaving football, um, like so many others, uh, homeless and 
uh, seemingly mentally ill and all of and when he died, his brain was looked at, and his brain was looked at by Bennett Omalu, and I guess he must have gotten his hands on another foot, maybe another Steeler brain. I forget the other guy who died. I'm forgetting names of these uh, Steelers who did die young and died after being bumped one too many times. And he puts two and two together, and if you look at what that discovery did, that discovery made right here in downtown Pittsburgh, and the impact of that discovery now, and the continuing impact of that discovery on football, professional football, on parents' willingness to allow their children to even play football, uh, the legal cases, the judge that just, I guess, has come out with what he thinks is a reasonable uh, pot of cash to be distributed among NFL players who can prove that they essentially suffer from this traumatic encephalopathy. And I'm sure a hell of a lot of them do, and some of them that are playing for uh, the Steelers right now do and will collect that money. So anyways, we'll have uh, Will Smith as that. I think that's so cool, though. So Jean Marie's going to get, like, in the... In the um, pss, pss, pss. And I think another piece she did is being looked at as a movie. Wow. That's exciting. <laughs> Fantastic. We'll have to have her on and pick her brain a little bit more. Uh, filming in Pittsburgh right now is uh, Jake Gyllenhaal, Rachel McAdams, Forrest Whitaker, and 50 Cent. Anybody see any of those guys around? Fiddy was at Fiddy? Yeah. Fiddy Cent was where? Ikea. Um, he was at Ikea. I, my friend works there. And she saw him? I haven't seen any of them, and I don't know if I'd recognize them if I did. I, I'd recognize, I don't think I'd recognize Fiddy. But uh, they're here uh, filming something called South Paw. And then there's another film uh, shooting much in my neighborhood. Keep tripping over these guys. Me and Earl and the Dying Girl. And I'm not quite clear what that one's about. Also, um, Fathers and Daughters with Russell Crowe and I forget who else, has apparently wrapped up. Jeez, guys, we really are. Hollywood! It's Hollywood out here. It's sort of fun to watch. And um, I, for one, would love it if they'd take my house for a while, and then I could, you know, wouldn't that be neat if they could use your house for a, <laughs> a scene, and then and you could go live somewhere else for a while, and then you come back and, you know, get paid for it? I would love that. And then you'd have this movie where... There was your house. I think that would be totally cool. Okay. If anybody wants to talk about anything, you're just going to have to let me know because, uh, the, as I said, the reality is is pff, I'm not seeing it. I am not seeing anything I want to uh, discuss. The, um, the world is too much with me, and I really do think there are days when I look, just the headlines alone make you, it can't, I mean, since we now know how much chemicals in our brains uh, influence how we're feeling, influence our immune system, influence our, our everything, our health, you cannot read the headlines in papers and, and, and not figure that they are making your brain put out sort of negative stuff, anxiety producing, you know, who, who, whatever those hormones are, fear and anxiety and blah, 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 and that's not good. It's not good. I have been told on more than one occasion by more than one medical person, back off, they say. You cannot immerse yourself in this stuff constantly because I'm too much a fragile flower, and I, I feel it. Other people, I suspect, can, and they're just not letting it as close. 
but it's 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 hard for me, and I'm having trouble right now with the way th- things are happening. I mean, my God, what's going on in the world? There was a picture in the paper just yesterday, and it was just one boy sitting at one of these damn holding pens down in Texas or something. He was a boy, and he was looking at the camera. He looked like my boy. My boy is South American. He looked just like my boy. And I almost started crying because he was staring right at me. And I looked at him, and I so wanted to, so wanted to reach into that paper and re- get him and hold him and save him, and I wanted to save them all. But you can't. And so I guess we sort of like pull away just in self-defense. I don't know. I find this so horrible, knowing the desperation that would drive a parent to part with the child in such frightening and dangerous conditions for a chance, a chance. And then we go on living our lives and we complain about the stupidest things. Oh, tossing around on my Tempur-Pedic bed last night, I just couldn't sleep. That's my complaint. Oh, I got to go to rehab. That's my complaint. And then you think of how, as you read the paper, look at all these other people who are alive on this world right now with you. You're all in the same place, essentially. And look at your life. And then look at theirs. And how the hell you don't feel some measure of survivor guilt. I don't. I don't know. All right, enough. When we come back, I am going to talk about something that will not make us feel guilty, maybe. And uh, it's frivolous. And it's a subject I brought up before, but it, it, it interests me. And since it's my show, I get to talk about it. That's the way this works, okay? So in just a matter of moments, We shall return. Stick around for more with Lynn Cullen Live after this. Pittsburgh City Paper's annual City Guide magazine is available now. Pick up one for a special look at the unique neighborhoods of Pittsburgh, plus the most complete guides of restaurants, bars, nightlife, festivals, exhibits, entertainment, and culture in the Berg. Pittsburgh City Paper, available at over 1,700 locations throughout western Pennsylvania and on the web at pghcitypaper.com, on your smartphone at citypapermobile.com. Well, last call, or almost, Last call for the urban gardener. I'm not going to be able to put this thought in your head too much longer. Uh, If you've never visited the urban gardener over on the north side, 1901 Brighton Road, give yourself a, a treat. That's all. Just a treat. You don't even have to need anything. Just go over there and look. There's never a more wonderful place than to stand in the middle of a nursery. I mean, with all that beauty around you and available to you. So whether it be flowers or trees, bushes, shrubs, or the kind of paraphernalia you need to care for them, landscaping materials, you will find it all there. And what you find there is often different from what you find at the more sort of normal places. (laughs) the regular places. Um, There's just something a little bit different, and that's what I took to the minute I first saw it, and I'm sure that's why they have been in business now for a long, long time. They do specialize in urban gardens, and urban gardens can be different. They can be small. They can require a lot of container gardening. So the women who own this place, they know this stuff. And they're a fount of information for you. So if you need a little fill-in here and there at this point in the summer, some things looking a little meh, 
and you want to perk up your garden because we got a lot of months ahead of us to enjoy, then head over there. Do yourself a favor. 1901 Brighton Road. Mention me. You'll get a discount. And if you have any questions about how the heck do I get there, just head to their website. They will give you every bit of information you need. It's not difficult. It's not like twist, turn, this, that, and the other. It's very direct. Urban Gardener, P-G-H dot com. Mm, need to get some rest. This is the worst headache ever. Mm, right arm's all tingly all of a sudden. Must have slept on it last night. I keep losing my balance. These old bones need some exercise. Granddaddy, what you just said doesn't even make sense. It sounds like gibberish. Signs like these could be more than what they seem. They could be a sign of stroke. Sudden weakness or numbness of the face, arm, or leg. Sudden trouble with vision in one or both eyes. Sudden trouble walking or difficulty with balance. Or a sudden intense headache that comes out of nowhere. If you or someone you know has any of these symptoms, don't wait. Call 911 immediately. You could make a difference in someone's life, someone you love, maybe even your own. Time lost is brain lost. Find out more at PowerToEndStroke.org. Brought to you by the American Heart Association, American Stroke Association, and the Ad Council. Have a question or an opinion? Call Lynn Cullen at 412-316-3381 or email lynn at pghcitypaper.com. Now, more with Lynn Cullen Live. Oh, here, here's some... Uh, I got such a well-connected audience. Here, uh, a Pittsburgh girl uh, writes, and she works in the film industry in these here parts, She says it must also be noted that the film about football players and concussions is being made by Sony Pictures. Sony is a company that has very little connection with the NFL or with the NCAA. Then she goes on to say, you know, that the same could not be said of Fox or Disney or CBS. And she wonders if Fox, Disney, and CBS films all maybe said, uh, uh, no, uh, no, I, I don't think we're going to do this one. Interesting, maybe. Then she says that if you watch the frontline piece on concussions in the NFL, you will see that this man, Dr. Bennett Omalu's story, is perfect she says, for a feature film. And apparently that's what Will Smith thought as well, since she goes on to tell us Will Smith was coming to Pittsburgh to shoot and star in another movie. But he pulled out of that movie to do this film instead on the concussion. And on this man. So that is cool and interesting. Jeez. Okay. Um, So this thing I want to bring up, I really want to know. If you were to start naming the dogs you currently know, in other words, what their names are. Just, Jess, name the dogs you know. Dogs in your life. Do you know any dogs? Yeah, I guess. Yeah, well, name some. What are their names? Kaya and Licha. Kaya and Licha? Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, eh? I know I have friends that are dogs. Okay, give me some cats then. Oh, Nori. Nori. And Fido. Fido? Mm-hmm. For a cat. That's good. <laughs> My cats are Thomas and Francis. Thomas and Francis. Connie. I have Addie and, and Dylan. Mm-hmm. Connie. Okay. Do you remember, and I'm going to think of the dogs I know. Sadie. Abby. Nellie. <laughs> Rocky. 
Dogs, dogs, I know. Why can't I think of you? <laughs> um, but the point being that other than Fido, all of the names you gave, you gave and I gave can also be a human name, right? Even though I didn't understand those first two you gave me. Yeah. But those are human names. I guess they could be. I, <laughs> Kaya could be. Kaya could be a human name. I mean, you can't tell anymore. Anybody's a human name. Yeah. You know, moon unit. Right. I mean, any, any, <laughs> yeah. anything. So... You would be hard-pressed if you drop back to 1955, let's say. Maybe even 1960, making a little closer for some of you. To find dogs named human names. Think of the dogs you knew when you were a kid. What were their names? Lassie. Lassie. <laughs> My dogs were Frisky. Barley, z uh, um, uh. Jesus, why can't I remember my dogs? Um, yeah, we named them dog names. We didn't name them human names. You would never in the 50s have encountered a dog named Nancy or a dog named George, but now we do, and it is rare to bump into, they're around, it's rare to bump into a dog now who has a dog name. In fact, now we'll take what used to be a dog named Fido and give it to a cat just to be ironic. <laughs> but you don't, you know, a stinky... Jumpy, <laughs> sparky, that kind of name. No one names them that anymore. Now, something like that bespeaks a change beyond. Like, why? What happened? All of a sudden, dogs don't have dog names. They have human names. It sort of coincides with the time that dogs start getting into the house a lot more than they used to. Uh, you know, geez, wasn't all that long ago when you, a lot of people owned dogs and would never think of letting them in the house. So as dogs worm their way into our homes and as they became part of the family, I guess it led to more of an anthropomorphization where you then you didn't you didn't separate them by giving them a a stupid dog name you included them by giving them a human name anyway here's what i think i think this has all led to a little bit of uh over the top stuff and i think it's it's led more than over the top and I think it's led to some real confusion on the part of some people. Now, I don't think it's mental illness, but I don't know that it's particularly healthy. What do you think? We all know people who don't have children and to whom their dog or their cat, is no longer an animal, but has a new job, which is surrogate child. And I sometimes find myself being put off <laughs> by, by the way some people deal with their dogs. Um, as if they're human when they're not. And I have interviewed experts in dogs who say they think it's screwing dogs up. That 
a dog who is being treated like a human is a dog who's going to have a lot more anxiety than a dog who's treated as a dog. Because dogs aren't human. This just in, your dog is not human. Many of the things you ascribe to it are not real. They are just your projections and anthropomorphization. And I think sometimes we're doing our dogs a disservice by this. I understand people are lonely, and I understand people love animal companionship. I am rarely in my life without an animal. So I understand all that, but geez. Do you all know people who, like, won't go on a vacation because they can't take the dog? You don't? No. I do. Do you know people who might want to go someplace else, but they can't go to that place, so they go to a, the only place they know where their dog can come to? Mm -hmm. I do. And I don't know if it's so much that they think that leaving their dog will traumatize the dog or that, in fact, what it is is leaving their dog will traumatize them. So having a dog be the central, the sort of arbiter of what it is you're, you can do is a real narrowing of your own boundaries and borders, it seems. I don't know. And when you see the money that people spend on their dogs and their cats, it's mind-boggling. You know, you can spend money on cat toys till you're blue in the face. You know what the best cat toy is? You know what the best cat toys are. A paper clip. The little round thing that comes off when you unscrew a, a, a bottle, the little round ring. Um, a paper bag. A box. They don't. All of, even the way the food is packaged, the names of the food and the way it's packaged are all packaged for us obviously, because we're the ones who are doing the buying. I sometimes marvel at the, the clear manipulation of marketers, their manipulation of animal lovers who are a little too besotted by their pets. And then they cost so much money. I don't know how, you know, I would like to think that a poor person could have a dog, a poor lonely person to keep them company. But it's hard, you know, and I suppose poor people do, and they might feed them table scraps and treat them, feed them, and, and deal with them like we used to, like when I was a kid. You Dogs didn't have to have all the accoutrements and paraphernalia and doctor's visits and God knows what. I mean, my I think I said this before. My vet told me the other day that my cat needed to have his teeth cleaned and that to do that, he would have to be anesthetized. So this would be essentially a surgical kind of a thing. And, of course, the cost of that is I didn't ask. I don't need to. If you asked anybody, anybody in the 50s and 60s and the 70s, hey, have you ever heard of your cat having its teeth cleaned? You'd be laughed at. <laughs> so I went to one of my medical providers yesterday. This is what sort of brought this up. And the, the woman who I was dealing with, 
uh, told me her latest cat story. She's a real cat lover. And she told me that one of her cats had gotten very ill, very ill, was not drinking, was not eating, was vomiting, was blah, 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 was listless. Takes him to the emergency vet. The emergency vet gives her a few things, this and that, and sends her home. No better the next day. Finally, 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 the dog, oh, they said, they said at the emergency vet, we can do x-rays, and we could do a CAT scan. And she's thinking, hey, x-rays, CAT scan, oh, my God. Um, no. And she took the cat and ran back home. Eventually, though, she ended up back at the emergency room, and they not only did x-rays, CAT scans, but they cut that cat open sort of sternum to, uh, to the bottom because what they found was that animal had ingested an earplug. You know, one of those little foamy earplugs? So had ingested it, and it made its way to the cat's small intestine, but then sort of blocked it. Oh, my God. Just Don't totally blocked Cats play with those. Cats play with those? Well, let Probably. me tell you, it can kill them. So in order to get that out, it required surgery and this and that and blah, 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 blah. So I asked her, uh-huh. And what was the bill? The bill was $4,500. Oh, my God. <laughs> what? This is a young woman. I don't think she's got $4,500. But now people are because they love their animals. And I know I had a, like, $1,500 bill from the same place when my cat got so sick. What? And then the guilt, if you do, as she said, her mother said to her, if we had a cat like that, we would have put it down. If the cat's unlucky enough to have swallowed that kind of thing, then it gets put down just to end its suffering, but you're not going to spend four thousand five hundred dollars so i don't know there's a huge industry now huge and it preys on the fact that we in this country at least have lost track of where animals sort of might fit in a just semi-rational manner in our lives. Because what happens is people who don't have this money spend it. I know someone else whose dog just died of cancer, but who put it through full round of chemo, another round of chemo, again, thousands and thousands of dollars, didn't have the money. these are, I think people have lost their minds a little bit. I do. And I say this as a true animal lover. I really think we need to get a grip. And for all you animal lovers who think having your animal is like having a child, I got news for you. It is not. It is most decidedly not. And I think it's a lot to put on a dog or a lot to put on a cat to be your surrogate child. There's so much dogs and cats can do for us in terms of what they willingly give than to sort of our own, the Yiddish word is mishigas, uh, than projecting our own mishigas onto them. And as a lot of, really, people who know would say, making them very anxious in the process. Okay? That's all I wanted to say, I think. I told you I didn't have anything today.
We got to take a break. I'll be right back. Email your questions and comments to Lynn at pghcitypaper.com or call Lynn at 412-316-3381. Lynn Cullen Live will return in a moment. Dave, what are you doing? Just sending a gift to Dave2037. Who? Me in the future. I save a little money from every paycheck for Dave2037 so he can buy anti-gravity boots or a hologram Doberman. What are you getting Steve2037? Steve2037 will be just fine. Well, okay, but don't expect to borrow my anti-gravity boots. Save something for the future. Put away a few bucks. Feel like a million bucks. For free ways to save, go to feedthepig.org. That's feedthepig.org. This message brought to you by the American Institute of Certified Public Accountants and the Ad Council. Pittsburgh City Paper's annual City Guide magazine is available now. Pick up one for a special look at the unique neighborhoods of Pittsburgh, plus the most complete guides of restaurants, bars, nightlife, festivals, exhibits, entertainment, and culture in the Berg. Pittsburgh City Paper, available at over 1,700 locations throughout western Pennsylvania and on the web at pghcitypaper.com, on your smartphone at citypapermobile.com. You're listening to Lynn Cullen Live at pghcitypaper.com. Once again, here's Lynn Cullen. Uh, In regard to what I've been saying, Roger writes that it reminds him of an experience his family had with Maisie the Yappy Nippy Dog. And he says this, neighbors uh, three doors down from us went on vacation. They asked my daughter home from college to watch and take care of their Maisie. She said yes, but not too enthusiastically because, you see, Maisie, the one-year-old Pepillon, has a bad rep on the street. She's bitten everyone in her house at least once, growls and snaps at everyone else within sight. And I think a big part of this is that the mother of the house carries Maisie everywhere. Oh, God, yes, I hate that. What are these people carrying their dogs? They say, oh, I have to take the dog for a walk. And it turns out the dog ain't walking. They're like, they're like some Chinese princess being carried on, you know, the backs of swarthy slaves or something. What kind of what? The first night of Maisie duty at 10 o'clock, my daughter went over to let Maisie out and do her business. The dog bit the hand trying to attach her to the lead outside and was off gallivanting, barking and terrorizing the street. Two hours later, close to midnight, with the assistance of her mother and a neighbor, my daughter was able to corral Maisie and bring her back in the house. The next day, since everyone was at work, I had to take care of Maisie. I was not looking forward to this. In the past, Maisie has made it very clear that given the opportunity, she would rip out my throat. I tentatively let myself in the house, waiting to be ravaged by the canine psychopath. To my surprise, she was not in sight and did not even bark. I carefully walked upstairs where Maisie's crate was kept. In the master bedroom, the dog was quietly huddled, in her urine-drenched bedding, and had not touched her food. Doggy depression was apparent. I was actually feeling bad for the little monster when an idea came to me. I went home and brought my two dogs back to see Maisie. Upon seeing them, Maisie crept out of her crate to sniff the strange dogs, allowing me to clip her leash onto her collar. The four of us then went for a walk around the block. I think it was a first for Maisie. Less than two houses away from her home, Maisie's head was up and her tail was wagging, and she seemed to really like being part of our little pack. After our walk, I decided to let her visit our home. She quickly became friends with our cat, twice Maisie's size, and proceeded to inhale our dog food. When my wife and daughter came home from work, she greeted them with a wagging tail and peed herself in excitement and rolled on her back, giving them access to her belly. So surprised and pleased with this now pleasant creature, we decided to let her stay with us the remainder of the week until her owners returned. We had a blast with her and she with us. Upon returning home, the neighbors demanded to know what we did with their dog. This was not their Maisie. Ever since, if she sees us outside, she runs to our house to greet us and comes inside to say hello to our dogs and cat. She no longer tries to grab hold uh, of uh, another neighbor's pants leg when he gets home and attempts to outrun her to his front door. She no longer greets others with a growl and bared teeth, but meets them with a bark and a wagging tail. Everyone wants to know what we did. The only explanation I can give is we introduced Maisie to our little pack and showed her 
a dog's life. I agree. Dogs are pack animals. I always feel sorry for a single dog. Dogs are pack animals. They need a friend. They need a pal. It can be a cat. It can be a gerbil. It can be a rabbit. Well, maybe not right. You don't know. But, yeah. So this guy treated the dog like a dog, and lo and behold, poor dog. People fuck their animals up all the time. Honest to Pete. Um... Political correctness night. The Class A Lowell spinners of minor league baseball went to a ridiculous extreme on their political correctness night to ensure that nobody was offended and in the process offended, ironically, all of the fans. <laughs> the bizarre promotion was explained on minor league baseball's official website, and here's how they explained it. Players committing an error will not be identified. Oh, this can't be. Will not... <laughs> will not be identified for fear of hurting their feelings. And gender-neutral terms will be used to refer to the players. For example, first base person instead of first base man. Along the same lines, there will be no bat boy, but instead a bat person. Additionally, the spinners will make every effort to not demean anyone, referring to the short stop as the vertically challenged stop. In addition, bases will not be identified as first, second, or third, and will be treated equally. <laughs> without numerical ranking. The foul lines will be identified as fair lines, and instead of having just one fan of the game, every fan will be recognized as the fan of the game. Finally, trophies will be handed out to each participant in between innings. Promotions and all contests will be evenly matched among genders, so there will be no losers and everyone is a winner. That cannot be true. You think I was born yesterday? Huh? Huh? I don't think that's true. So, this is a strange thing. I had a, um, I think I mentioned this book yesterday called The Bend of the World. I'm going to set up uh, an interview so we can meet the author, who is a Pittsburgher, Jacob Bacharach. This is uh, quite a book. And it's a debut novel that has uh, gotten attention from important people. I know Jacob Backrack, and when he told me he'd written this book, I said, "Oh my gosh, I have to read it." Give me so he gave me a uh, you know one of those early copies, and I started reading it and couldn't quite get in. I just thought, meh, 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 whatever. And I, saw, I, I put it down, and then I just flat out lost the book. I can't find that book. Another friend of mine had the book and uh, said he enjoyed it very much. And then Tom Sokolowski emails me one day, says, you have got to read this book, and you've got to have this guy on your show. And I said, gee, I tried, and I, and I mean, I love the author, but I, I said, I, I just thought it wasn't for me. So anyway, um, maybe about three, four days ago, I picked it up. You found it? No, I had to borrow, I still haven't found it. I borrowed a friend's. I picked it up, started reading, and thought, geez, this is good. Now, why, why on a second, I mean, does that show that there are times when you'll pick up a book and it just is not the right time to be reading that book? You're not in the right mood to be taken to that mm -hmm. book. Must be, because I'm the same person, the book is the same book, and I reacted with the first time with, oh, this is too weird and it's too complicated and I don't get it. And oh my God, what? There's UFOs in it. I, uh, uh. Second time, I saw how well written it was, how 
beautifully the um, how funny it was. I didn't even see how funny it was in the first reading. How um, I love the way this author describes Pittsburgh. You know, he he's, he describes uh, places that we all know. And sometimes, have you ever thought to yourself, how would I describe coming through the tunnel? Or how, if I had to write it down, would I describe the houses, you know, hanging on the hillsides and the, and the strange topography and the neighborhoods and, and, and all of that? How would I do that? Well, if you can't write, you're not going to do it very well. And I've read a lot of books set in Pittsburgh, and this book, more than any, really gets the descriptive aspect of Pittsburgh. And I think it's just brilliant. And I, I recommend it to you, uh, and I promise to have Jacob Bacharach uh, on the sh- on the show, he's a young man. I think he's 29 years old. Uh, graduate of Oberlin in writing, um, MBA I believe from Pitt, and he works with the Cultural Trust. And I believe he manages the Benedum Theater, which is a lot for a 29 year old. I think. And I met him socially but then got to know him better because he also uh, sits on the board of the Western Pennsylvania, of Western Pennsylvania's Planned Parenthood. And uh, I joined that board uh, last year. And I was blown away by his intelligence and his business sense and his, just, I mean, this is a really interesting, funny smart young Pittsburgher. Born and raised here, too. And um, I'm, I'm looking forward to having him on. So I am going to let him know. Jacob, after a long, long time interspersed with, you know, hospital visits, surgeries, and pain and anguish, I finally, finally, and once I started it, once I saw what a great book it was, I gobbled it up. You know, it's one of those things where you can't get anything done that you have to do because you have to finish the book. Mm -hmm. That happened to me yesterday. I had all this stuff I had to do, and I couldn't. I had to finish the book. So we'll definitely have Jacob on. Maybe next week, huh? Maybe next week. We'll see what his schedule is. So, and I did want to say something today about bikers, but I didn't get around to it because we're out of time. Uh, I see that we're trying to be more and more a bike city and friendly to bikes. But even at that, as I applaud that, knowing that that's the right way to go, I got to say that as somebody who drives a car, some of these bikers are almost begging to be killed. And I... I don't want to be the person who kills one of them. I have had a number of occurrences lately where I am left with my knees shaking, my heart pounding, uh, adrenaline infused, because out of nowhere a bike will, you know, like just cut in front of me. Or, and, and I'm just telling you guys, Don't ruin my life by having me be the person who runs into you. A lot of these bikers are not responsible. And God knows there's a lot of lousy drivers around, too. So, just saying, just saying, please. I love the fact that we're going to integrate more bicycles, but... It ain't going to work if both the drivers of cars respect the rules and the bikers respect the rules. And we got a whole bunch of both that don't. 
and this can lead to a lot of disaster. That would ruin my life if I killed somebody. Even if it weren't my fault, it would ruin my life. Don't I have enough anxiety? So listen, you bikers, damn you. Follow the rules. Who the hell do you think you are? Thank you very much. That's all I wanted to say. And I think that ends the program for today. Uh, tomorrow, Mr. Sokolowski, who I would like to see on a bicycle. Don't you think that'd be funny? No. No? no. You know, can you see Tom on a bicycle? Huh? Cycler. He doesn't seem like a bicycle person. He won't even walk here. He, he won't, won't even walk here, Jess says, and he lives downtown. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'd like to see Tom on a bike. Okay, you guys, uh, sorry for the lack of uh, meaty uh, topics uh, today, but, you know, some days that's all you got. See you tomorrow. Have a good one. Lynn Coven Live, Monday through Friday from 10 a.m. to 11 a.m. and archived at pghcitypaper.com. The opinions expressed on Lynn Coven Live are those of the host and do not necessarily reflect the viewpoints of Pittsburgh City Paper, Steel City Media, and its advertisers.